you get your views from television news, you'll only hear stories that corporations choose. You'll only get to see what they want you to see. You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe. We all watched in horror 911. The planes hit the towers and the towers came down. Did you ever wonder how they fell so fast? Well, maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask. Don't you think it's strange? There were no fighter jets. Did someone give the order not to intercept? And if they really scrambled, then why'd they fly so slow? Maybe there's an answer that we don't want to know. And where was our president, George W. That fool? He was visiting with children at an elementary school. And when he heard the news, he didn't seem concerned. He just calmly read a picture book while all those people burned. The Bushes and Bin Ladens. Now what's that all about? While all of us were grounded, they flew his family out. Osama got his training from the CIA. Our soldiers took Afghanistan, they let him slip away. A new Pearl Harbor was their big chance. Here we go. Howdy. I'm Bill Olson, and this is the special 10-year anniversary edition of 9-11 was an inside job. You'll find it to be a little different than what's been going on all week long. But to start the show, today we have three guests from the 9-11 movement. Um, we're going to go ahead and switch to them, and I'll introduce them one at a time. Um, We've got David Fira, Gregory Fiegel, and uh, Marcella Pina. And they're just to my right, there, here they are. And they brought with them today a brand new DVD from Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And we have two members of that group here besides myself. And go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, so today we're gonna be uh, showing uh, part of a two-hour video, the latest video produced by architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. This video that we're going to see today is going to focus on the Twin Towers. Uh, next week, uh, the same video will be shown again, but it will focus on Building 7. Um, also, uh, the video in its entirety will be shown tomorrow at 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock at the Hillsdale Library in Southwest Portland. Uh, the address for that library is uh, 1525 Southwest Sunset Boulevard. It's um, right next to the, the main commercial section of Hillsdale. So um, uh, hopefully uh, some of you can make it to that as well. And in, in the video, well, if you want to talk about um, a little bit about the video, but um, the film features, if you want to. Okay, yes, the film itself features uh, cutting edge 9-11 evidence from more than 50 experts in their fields. 
high-rise architects, structural engineers, physicists, chemical engineers, firefighters, metallurgists, explosive experts, controlled demolition experts, and more. They are each highly qualified. Several have PhDs, including renowned phys uh, scientist Lynn Margulis, who was awarded the National Medal of Science in 1999 and who exposes in this film the fraud of NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and discusses how the scientific method should have been applied to the destruction of evidence and to the high temperature incendiaries in World Trade Center uh, 1 and 2 and 7 uh, in the dust samples. Uh, the documentary is filled with wisdom from experts such as Les Young, one of several high-rise architects interviewed in the film, who remarks, I would not have expected the whole buildings to just give in at once, and I thought it rather odd that they fell almost perfectly in very similar ways. It seemed odd that lightning would strike twice. In the full-length documentary, they also interviewed almost a dozen psychologists who helped to explain why 9-11 truth is so difficult for the public to even face, much, le much less accept, and what we can do better to reach them. We also hear from several 9-11 victim family members who support AE 9-11 truth in their call for a new investigation. Uh, psychologist William Woodward, PhD, one of eight mental health professionals who is also a AE 9-11 Truth petition signer, provides a profound insight in that section of the film. Reconciliation through the truth is a deep path to psychological recovery from the myths and lies around which this historic event has been cloaked in the official view. So um, I hope you enjoy the, the, the video. and. Do you want to say anything else, Marcel? Um, I, I think, uh, well, I, I, I just want to remind everyone that we are going to be screening the video tomorrow in its entirety at the Hillsdale Li Library, which is, the address is 1525 Southwest Sunset Boulevard. And again, right now we're just showing a portion of the two-hour video. And um, yeah, and next week we're going to be showing again the Building 7 portion of it. Gregory, if you'd like to say anything. And I also understand that they're going to be uh, screening the video at various times during the week uh, on this station. Yes, here here on Channel Twenty Three, um, in the next uh, in the next month, they're going to be showing the video in its entirety, the two-hour video for Architects and Engineers for Nine Eleven Truth, new video called Nine Eleven Explosive Evidence. Experts speak out. They're going to be yes showing it at least ten times in the next month on this channel, Channel Twenty Three. I don't have specific d dates, but I do know that they're going to be showing it at least 10 times in the next month. This is the original site of the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Construction is now underway where dramatic new facilities are being erected. Just 10 years ago, the planes hit the towers, cutting through some exterior and interior supporting structural steel columns. The fuel from the planes ignited office fires across several floors. According to the official reports, the structural steel frame was weakened and failed, causing a total progressive collapse of each tower. Does the official explanation make sense? Was there a comprehensive investigation that examined all of the evidence? Let's look at the details. These buildings were designed to take multiple impacts from airliners. I walked into the office uh, and the first uh, words that I heard was a plane's just run into the World Trade Center. And my initial thought was, well, that's okay. It's built to withstand uh, a 707. He stated that the uh, fuel would be dumped into the building, but the building would still be there. Although most of the fuel blew out the opposite side of the building. These buildings are built to handle several times the load above them. So those perimeter columns could handle five times the load above them and the core columns could handle three times the load above them. The majority of the jet fuel was burnt up instantly in the big fireball, and it was gone. The fires that were left were office furnishings and carpet and things like that. A lot of things in these kind of buildings have to be fire resistant by nature. It's required by code. So there really isn't a whole lot of fuel in there to begin with. The media portrayed the, these fires as being extremely hot, but uh, 
the fires were not that hot in, in World Trade Center 1 and 2. If you look at the NIST zone data, you could see this. And, um, and to, uh, to, to use our own powers of observation, you could tell by, by seeing these fires uh, and seeing black smoke come out the windows, that means that the, the fires were oxygen starved and it was incomplete uh, combustion. And so it was a low temperature fire. I am Robert Podolsky. I have a degree, master's degree in theoretical physics from Xavier University in Cincinnati. I worked for 10 years as a professional physicist, engineer, uh, systems analyst for government and for industry. Uh, companies like AVCO, GE, Bendix, and also uh, Air Force Avionics Lab and the Coast Guard Electronics Division. I looked up in a manual the burning temperature of jet fuel and found that under the conditions that existed at the World Trade Center on 9-11, uh, that jet fuel had to have been burning at about 750 degrees Fahrenheit. I also noticed that the official explanation of what happened there was that the heat from the fire supposedly softened the steel and thereby brought the buildings down. If you have a flame at 750 degrees, you can hold that flame under a steel beam forever and you'll never reach a high enough temperature to bend steel, let alone melt it. So immediately I knew at that point that the official explanation was dead wrong. There was no way those flames could have possibly brought about the collapse of the building. It did not seem possible that these, these towers that were designed to withstand the impact of a 707 could possibly collapse in such a short order of time from the time that they were hit. There's no way the building was designed to take the impact of one, if not more, multiple airplanes. They were designed to withstand uh, hurricane force winds of up to 140 miles an hour. My first reaction was that looks like controlled demolitions. However, I believe the official story because it was played to me over and over again. I heard repeated experts telling me that this was terrorists that did this and that it was planes that brought those buildings down. So I accepted the official story. The NIST testing of the uh, Twin Tower floor assemblies done at Underwriters Laboratories. This was done per ASTM E119 in a two hour, 2000 degree fire test. During the test, the main trusses sagged approximately four inches after 60 minutes and six inches after 100 minutes. Yet NIST had the main trusses sagging well over 40 inches in their models. Rather than a slow groaning collapse that we might anticipate, the Twin Towers show in the videos a very rapid, sudden onset of destruction. What does this imply? I'm Frank Collinan, a practicing civil engineer in the state of California. I have a Bachelor of Science from Chico State, which I received in 1988. I've been a licensed civil engineer since 1993. I specialize in bridge construction, retaining wall construction, small building construction, bridge demolition, and I have experience in bridge design and building design. Structural steel is required by building and design cones to prevent catastrophic failure and loss of public life. Everybody's seen the building collapses on 9-11 and it was shocking how fast the buildings collapsed. The way the buildings fell was not indicative of the way a, a building that's in distress collapses. This doesn't happen with structural steel buildings and never has and never will again. We assume that fires could destroy a building. Why people select steel buildings is because they would destroy slowly. It would gradually twist and bend and give people plenty of time and safety in getting out of the building. The uh, basic philosophy of the building codes in the last 75 to 80 years has been to ensure ductile failure of the members to provide for the public safety. Uh, under this philosophy, uh, members that are overloaded will deform elastically 
uh, within the elastic range of the material with increasingly large deformations and deflections. This gives rise to large deformations that are uh, visible and apparent to the occupants of the structure, and this gives them time to evacuate the structure. I would not have expected the whole building to just give in at once, and I thought it rather odd that they um, fell almost perfectly uh, in, in very similar ways. Um, it seemed odd that lightning would strike twice. Upon further review of the videos of the tower's destruction um, in the 9-11 Blueprint for Truth DVD, I was surprised to see the upper floors of the North Tower, the upper 15 floors of the North Tower, implode prior to any destruction of the tower below because it would be logical that as a result of the plane crash that the, the upper 15 floors would start to damage the floors below, not the floors above. And it certainly would stay in the damage zone. It would not drop down through 80,000 ton of insulated, undamaged structural steel and do it in 12 seconds. I discuss the NIST claim that the upper section of each of the towers crushed the lower section. However, when you Watch video closely, in the case of World Trade Center 1, you'll see that the upper section disintegrates itself. Its lower stories are breaking up before it even impacts the lower section. It appears to be a controlled demolition of its own, of the upper section. The tops of the buildings were basically uh, disintegrated. The top section pushing on the bottom section it's going to meet equal forces as it goes. Both sections are going to be uh, demolished at the same rate. So by the time you've crushed up 15 stories below it, the top 15 stories are also going to be crushed. And so there's nothing left now to crush the rest of the building. So there's so many paradoxes here. A little tiny chunk of the building can't possibly fall and crush the entire structure below it. Well, there's demolitions uh, done in France, which use what we call the Vernage te technique, where they take out a couple floors worth of columns with hydraulics. They take the columns out and they let the building, the upper section of the building, drop two full floors. And when it impacts the lower section, there's a very definitive, observable jolt, deceleration, and velocity loss. You're looking for a jolt that this thing, if it actually comes down and hits, you should be able to see the point at which they actually impact because it would actually slow down the motion of the falling block. And you can see it in the graph. It is not there in the case of the North Tower. It never slows down. It accelerates the entire time. And that was what was extremely significant. So I published a paper about that. It's in the Journal of 9-11 Studies. And so if you had the top section acting like a pile driver, if, in fact, it actually hit and made an impact, it was effectively crushing anything, pushing hard on this core structure below it, the core structure is going to push back equally hard. And that's what's going to cause the top section of the building to slow down. But the fact that it's constantly accelerating downward is evidence that it didn't slow down. It's not actually hitting and engaging with the structure below it in any way that could demolish it. The top section is not crushing the bottom section of the building or it would meet resistance. I am Richard Human. I am a retired professional electrical engineer. I went to Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute and received the Bachelor of Electrical Engineering degree in 1954. I worked for Joseph Loring uh, for 41 years and was principal chief electrical engineer for the World Trade Center complex. I was very familiar with uh, the Twin Towers elevator systems uh, because uh, we took over uh, conceptual maintenance and improvements of the elevator systems after the, the project was completed. Uh, I actually ran and rode up and down elevated shafts on the top of a car 
going 1,200 feet a minute, uh, you could imagine the experience. I'm, I'm very familiar with the interior structure uh, that surrounded the elevator shafts and uh, the accessibility which the elevator companies had 24-7. The only way that I can see that the towers could have collapsed is that the interior columns were compromised. In Tower 1, uh, unless my eyes were deceiving me, before the tower started collapsing from the top, the antenna started to fall. And the antenna, uh, of course, was over the middle of the elevator shafts. And, uh, of course, uh, their access to the elevator shafts gave them total access to the surrounding core columns, the interior of the core columns. NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, acknowledges that the towers came down at essentially free-fall acceleration. What are the implications of that admission? The measurements have indicated that Tower 1 collapsed in about 11 seconds and Tower 2 collapsed in about 9 seconds. And the argument goes that this is essentially the rate at which free-fall would happen. I had a friend that asked me uh, if it was possible for the Twin Towers to achieve near free fall speed when they collapsed. The Twin Towers could, could not have come straight down through the thousands of tons of structural steel through the greatest resistance, the resistance of 80,000 tons of structural steel at the speed of uh, practically free fall. That just would not happen. There are columns of steel around the exterior of the building and within the core, all of which are there to prevent uh, the, the thing from falling down. And so if, even if something falls on it, it's not going to immediately just go pop, 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 like that, floor by floor. It's going to, if it's going to collapse, it's going to have to take some time to weaken the structure below it. This structure was capable of holding three to five times the weight and here it is falling through it with a resistance of only one-third of its weight. Roughly 90% of the resistance has been removed, and what's happening is the top section is not crushing down the lower section like a pile driver, which is the picture that NIST basically is painting. It's, it's actually falling into material that's already been pulverized. It's offering very little resistance. It's just coming down through pre-pulverized material. One of the fundamental laws of nature is the conservation of energy. There was no time for this elastic deformation and plastic deformation, which would have absorbed energy and decreased the descent to less than free fall speed. As energy is drained away from the system to deform those members, it would slow down the descending mass and cause a descent at less than free fall speed. This is high school physics, and our whole society is being led to believe that these fundamental laws of physics, hard science, don't apply anymore. I think that should really frighten all of us. Over 400 connections per second had to fail in order for the, mem for the members to be released and for the structure to descend at almost free fall rate. Structural connections not only had to fail nearly simultaneously, but in sequential order. The buildings fall at a speed uh, which can only occur if the structure has been removed, the vertical structure. This block accelerates straight down, uh, or it's picking up speed downward continually. It doesn't slow down, it just continues to gain speed. From what I, what I understand, the buildings actually accelerated as they came down, meaning they were not getting resistance from these massive columns in the center of the core of this building. The core of this building was very heavy. They're huge columns, huge. I could not see how 
those massive, very thick columns could just snap like that. I would have expected them to, most of them to stay uh, intact with the floors collapsing around them. I'm Alfred Lopez. I'm a registered professional structural engineer in the state of Michigan and have been in private practice for 40 years with Lopez Engineering. I've worked on several high-rise projects with uh, office buildings above parking decks and um, high-rise apartment buildings here in the Detroit area. I've done uh, numerous uh, investigations of uh, failures of buildings because of uh, fire and uh, wind damage. I was shocked at, the, at how the buildings collapsed, but expected that they would have come down much slower that they would have tipped over, that, the, that the, the whole thing did not make sense. And um, ever since then, I had a hard time believing that uh, the fires did drop those buildings. I thought that given the way the planes hit the building, uh, one side would have given away first and it, it just would have fallen off or fallen over at a steep angle, but the way the whole thing just gave way at once and started to plummet down without slowing down as it went down. Um, again, just like the controlled demolition I witnessed personally. The area below the damage zone where the planes flew in and where the fire was, um, <clears throat> that area below that, those 80 or 90 stories, 80,000 tons of structural steel was not damaged in any way, yet you stood there and watched it destroy itself, wiping out floor by floor all 287 structural columns as if they didn't exist underneath the uh, damage zone. According to the first responders' oral histories, which were reported in the New York Times, over a hundred first responders reported sounds of explosions and flashes of light at the onset of destruction of both towers. These were not discussed in the NIST report. What did these eyewitnesses actually see and hear? All the other evidence of seeing flashes and explosions and the melted metal, and uh, the, the dust particles uh, and with the, chemical, the explosive chemicals found in the, in the debris, um, the, it, there's just a lot of questions about what's been going on and that these questions have not been answered or even addressed in any sort of full way. We have eyewitness testimony of firemen, policemen, news reporters and occupants of the building to explosions, an enormous number of eyewitness testimonies. There was a uh, heavy-duty explosion. Inside the lobby. Is that a secondary explosion? Yes, it was. There were numerous secondary explosions taking place in that building. It was con there were continuous explosions. There was a secondary explosion, probably a device either planted before or on the aircraft that did not explode until an hour later. Then there was those secondary explosions and then the subsequent collapses. It sounded like gunfire. You know, bang, 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 bang. And then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. About 50 consecutive bangs and it went fell down like a waterfall. And we heard the noise uh, associated with an implosion. We heard a very loud blast, an explosion. We heard a loud explosion. At that point, we heard a large boom. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like, it, to me, it sounded like an explosion. There was another major explosion. All of a sudden, you hear explosion, and you could see the building starting to collapse. Huge explosion that we all heard and felt. Uh, we could hear a rumble, which was uh, about five seconds long, preceding the actual collapse, and then a boom uh, when each of those towers collapsed. Uh, just seconds ago, there was a huge explosion, and it appears right now the second World Trade Tower has just collapsed. I was about five blocks away when I, I heard uh, explosions. And then you heard from far away, boom, boom. And you heard the boom, 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 boom. It was like it was if, if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, as detonated. If they were planned to yeah. take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. And it just started going pop. It just started going boom, 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 boom. And he goes, how fast? I go like firecrackers. 
One of the one of Nis other excuses was that there were no blast sounds heard by witnesses or recorded. There's so many videos of witnesses from that day that report explosions. There's radio transmissions from the FNY. We have the transcripts that were recorded, you know, back in 2001 of all these firefighters and first responders reporting explosions. There's no doubt they were heard. In the oral histories of the emergency personnel taken down late 2001 and early 2002, there are over a hundred individuals who make comments about seeing, hearing, and feeling explosions in those buildings. These oral histories were documented well before NIST started their World Trade Center investigation in September 2002. This testimony should have caused the presumption that there was a good chance explosive residue would be found and justified testing for it rather than the opposite. Reviewing the um, uh some of the eyewitness uh, accounts and people hearing what sounded like explosions and, and, and things like that. Again, it just, it, it didn't seem very um, plausible for any other type of, of uh, cause for such an event. It doesn't look like a collapse. It's like a huge mushrooming, billowing uh, kind of an event. Um, that whole thing looks nothing like a building falling down. It's a building being blown up, and it's being blown up progressively from the top down. That's what the physics shows. The NIST acknowledges in their response to a request for correction that they are unable to provide a full explanation of the total collapse, yet they refuse to consider the possibility that explosives or some other form of demolition device could have been used to cause the collapses of the towers. And the fact that controlled demolition is consistent with all the available technical evidence. And the response to that request for correction is this simply saying they're unable to provide a full explanation for the total collapse, even though that was their task given to them by Congress. The core structure of the building had to have been destroyed by other means. FEMA documents a 1,200-foot diameter debris field around each tower. Videos show multi-ton steel sections of hundreds of individual steel pieces ejecting out of the towers at 60 miles an hour for a distance of 600 feet. They also show clouds of debris pulverized in mid-air and isolated explosive ejections as many as 60 stories below the so-called crush zone. Videos also show the near total destruction of both towers. What does all this tell us about the forces and energies involved in the destruction? The spread of debris in a large radius around each tower, what we see is an outward uh, explosion of material beyond the perimeters of each footprint. And this is not expected, and it's not congruent with the reports of our government. Debris that was shooting out for hundreds of feet in all directions, 70 miles an hour, leaving the, the 80th floor of the North Tower and making a fairly uh, level trajectory, uh, that to me is fairly alarming. Large multi-ton beams were hurled hundreds of yards laterally. Gravity works vertically, not laterally. The number I got was 78 miles an hour. So something's happening to throw these things horizontally at those kinds of speeds. And here it is trailing white smoke the whole time. It, it really is indicative of um, some kind of explosion. The individual explosions that I noticed 20 and 30 and 40 stories below the collapsing structure, those are what we demolitions guys call squibs. And that's another characteristic that seems to be evident. Well, in the case of the South Tower, you can see these jets of black smoke being ejected from many locations on many different floors above the level of the impact. There's a whole bunch of these uh, squibs or puffs that are coming out the side of the building. And uh, naysayers tend to say, well, that's just air being blown out the windows because you have like an accordion effect. It's being compressed. Well, it's going on at a lot of different levels at the same time is one thing. And if you're compressing it out here, if you're blowing out the windows down here, how are you getting the air pressure? I mean, it doesn't really work to say it's just air pressure. I estimated these are coming out faster than 100 miles an hour. The uh, 
impact of the floors pancaking upon themselves would create gushes of air out the side, but not the kind of explosive force that we saw that would throw I-beams across the street into the windows of other buildings. The uh, ejection of the materials out of the building, the manner in which it fell, the speed at which it fell, it exhibited all the signs of demolitions and the completeness of the destruction down to their individual elements. When the South Tower was destroyed, at first it looked like it was going to land in the street or take a building out next to it, and then all of a sudden it disappears in this huge cloud of smoke, uh, which didn't seem to make sense at the time. How can those steel columns, the massive steel columns that they are, supporting that weight of that building, virtually disappear? Why aren't they poking up straight out of, the, out of that rubble at the bottom of the building? As an architect, I would expect to see um, larger portions of the building floors, uh, the decking, the steel decking, the concrete topping, uh, much larger remnants of what the structural components of this building was. There were just small fragments of uh, strewn steel components. There should have been much larger pieces for examination on the ground. After all, there was 110 floors in each building, and each floor plate was over an acre in size. But the fact that it was all reduced to rubble and powder uh, just did not make sense at all. We have no explanation of how the concrete was pulverized. It takes an enormous amount of energy, way beyond what we have in aviation fuel. There were two substations on the 108th floor, uh, the 75th floor and the 41st floor and the 7th floor. Uh, at those eight locations, there were four transformers in each substation that weighed over 30,000 pounds. In the substations on the mechanical floors in each tower, the transformers would not explode on their own. They were air-cooled, dry-type transformers. And yet, after the collapse, uh, there was, uh, as from what was reported, there was no evidence of them being found at the bottom of the towers. Uh, I wonder why. It was a shame that after the collapse, that a, a forensic unit, a forensic engineering unit, didn't go into the debris and try to find at that time why the towers had collapsed. I'm sure there was other evidence uh, that, that could have given a better indication at the time that there was something else wrong. In its report on World Trade Center 7, which came out in May of 2002, FEMA documents in Appendix C steel that has been melted and even partially evaporated, resembling Swiss cheese. What are we to make of this? My name is Jeff Fair. I have a PhD in material science and engineering from the University of Minnesota. I have a BA in physics from Brigham Young University. I've worked with uh, solid state reactions. I've worked uh, um, characterizing materials uh, ma semiconductor materials, thin films. Uh, I currently do a lot of work with uh, nanoparticles as well as uh, solid state reactions. So Jonathan Barnett's study, uh, which I thought was very well done and, and quite extensive, is all documented by FEMA in Appendix C in their, in their BPAT report that was May of 2002. Unfortunately, it was never used in the NIST report my name is Jason Cheshire and I'm a licensed professional engineer in the province of Ontario in Canada and I have uh, been working in the field of hydrometallurgy for the past 10 years uh, for a major company here in Canada. And I'd like to know why NIST excluded the document uh, from FEMA in Appendix C that uh, documented this, the, the evidence of melting steel. Well, why is this not included. Why is this forensic evidence not being included in the report? First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten steel. 
Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who has said so, nobody who's produced it. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Like a molten bit. steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. Lava. Like, like, it was like lava, lava from a volcano. It actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped down the sides of a wall. And the cleanup was very difficult in the beginning. Steel was coming out red in certain areas from the first couple of weeks. This fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel. And they pulled out the big block of concrete, and there was a, like a little river of steel uh, flowing. My name is Mark Basile. I'm a chemical engineer. I have a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I've worked for about 25 years in industry and the majority of what I do is analytical work uh, and figuring out what materials are composed of, why they are what they are, why they do what they do. There were sections of them that clearly showed melting. They had uh, sections that were thinned away and there were actually holes through them and some of the ends were just melted away or even possibly evaporated away. I'm Kathy McGrade. I have a bachelor's in metallurgical engineering from New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, which I got in 1979. I then spent the next 30 years uh, with three startup companies in an office fire you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. And yet we have evidence of molten iron in the microspheres, in the rubble pile, and the, the, the metal pouring out of the side of the tower. We could have filled up the Twin Towers with jet fuel and burned it all up and that, that does not cause a fire hot enough to melt structural steel. My name is Gary Warner. I'm a uh, mechanical engineer. I hold a professional certification from, the, uh, from uh, the Association of British Columbia. I worked as a, uh, uh, in the project engineering department of the casting plant uh, of Elcan, the aluminum company of Canada, one of the largest aluminum smelters on the planet at the time. And uh, in that smelter we turned aluminum oxide into aluminum, mol molten aluminum. Molten aluminum is silver. It's not yellow, it's silver. It looks like mercury. The yellow molten metal that I saw pouring out of the South Tower uh, is indicative of molten iron. I was a bit incredulous when I learned that NIST claimed that the uh, molten metal was aluminum. It doesn't look at all like molten aluminum. Looks like iron, molten iron. That's what it looks like. And I've seen tons of it. We used to cast this uh, in Alcan. We, they still cast it. I spent two years casting that. I'm David Gregg. I have a master's and PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Illinois. Afterwards, I went to work for Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, where I worked there for more than 30 years. You cannot get a flame hot enough to start the metal to molten, make it molten in the first place so that this other process takes off. I don't know of any mechanism for that. The only way that's known that a carbonaceous material can cause steel or iron oxide to, to be, turn into a molten metal is in a blast furnace. Yeah, and that's very different than what we had. An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum which, when ignited, sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open-air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. The next question is, how do you get, how do you get the sulfur um, in these uh, pieces of steel or, or in the debris. And, um, and that question is, is unanswered. There's a version of thermite called thermate, which has uh, sulfur in the, in the thermate to, and what the, th what the sulfur does, it, it uh, 
It's sort of like um, salt on ice. Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide and it just basically makes the uh, steel melt at a lower temperature. So instead of having to bring the steel up to 1500 centigrade, you can slice through it with material that's at 900 or 1000 degrees centigrade. And if you do a search on Google for uh, thermite and building demolition, you can find all sorts of wonderful devices that have been fabricated uh, and invented that use thermite for building demolitions. Thermite is, in the old-fashioned thermite, is a mixture of pulverized aluminum and pulverized rust. And if you can get these, this mixture to react, which is not so easy, it produces tremendous heat. And this is what you call an incendiary. An incendiary is something which can be used to destroy something by the means of heat. While an explosive is something which reacts, acts with pressure. It knocks things apart. Now, the old-fashioned incendiary is not an explosive. It, but it is still used for military purposes for melting iron structures. Practical applications of thermite involve uh, things such as equipment decommissioning in the military. When they have a piece of artillery or a tank or something like that that they don't want to leave behind to the enemy, they throw what are called grenades, thermite grenades down the barrel, let's say. Uh, but thermite does not explode. It simply reacts, produces large amounts of heat and molten material. In the case of thermite cutting charges, you would have heard far less noise since they are worked by uh, thermal heating, melting of the steel, rather than an explosive cutting as in RDX charges. I'm Kim R. Ellen. I have a degree in chemical engineering from Clarkson University in 1963. After graduating, I served two years as a reserve officer in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, where among other things, I had training in uh, explosives such as C4. I was involved in the industrial chemical industry for 20 years with uh, major companies. There were reports of uh, molten steel having been seen in the, uh, in the rubble pile of all three buildings. And uh, I knew that jet fuel, uh, which is essentially kerosene, uh, is not uh, capable of melting steel nor iron. Um, kerosene or jet fuel uh, burns uh, at less than 1600 degrees Fahrenheit and molten steel needs at least uh, 2700 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in order to uh, melt. The thing that uh, most struck me about the 9-11 incident was uh, following the incident how uh, overflights had detected uh, with infrared camera 1400 degree Fahrenheit hotspots on the surface uh, of ground zero and uh, that being there for a week, um, you know, indicates that there was something very hot going on below the surface. Another question that may haunt the new Freedom Tower. According to USGS, they found as much as 6% of the World Trade Center dust consisted of tiny, previously molten iron spheres. What does this tell us about the temperatures generated in the tower's destruction? My name is Adam Parrott and uh, I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Queen's University. I've been working for an environmental consulting firm for a number of years. When the USGS collected samples of the World Trade Center dust, uh, they found the iron microspheres Insofar, the USGS does not have a valid explanation for the presence of these iron microspheres. But I've independently seen uh, thermitic activity within two separate independent samples of World Trade Center dust. I'm Jerry Lobdell. I'm a retired physicist and chemical engineer. I have a BS in chemical engineering from Texas Tech, and I have uh, extensive coursework in mathematics and physics from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I've had broad experience in analysis and applied research. 
30-year professional history spanning physics, chemical engineering, statistical analysis and modeling, and operations research. So what do the microspheres contain? Uh, iron is the main element, and then it has smaller portions of aluminum, sulfur, a trace of manganese, a trace of uh, potassium. Most of them are less than about a tenth in, of an inch in diameter, and they're spherical, and they're found in all of the dust blown out of the buildings during collapse, no matter where in Manhattan the, that dust is picked up. You must have had a much hotter heat source for you to get 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit in order to melt the, the steel, melt the iron, to get these iron, these spheres, these molten spheres. Your heat source must be something like a chemical reaction, an exothermic chemical reaction that reacts, in the case of thermite, reacts at 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. My contention based on finding thermite residue in the dust is that it happened before. It didn't happen after in the, in the fires that ensued in the rubble pile afterwards. It's the, all the characteristics of the microspheres along with what I see in the attack of the, uh, the beams that were actually found tell me that thermite was involved in melting that, uh, those steel beams. Out of the ashes of the World Trade Center devastation rises the Freedom Tower, whose foundation, however, is shrouded in question. For example, in the World Trade Center dust, an international team of scientists find an advanced form of highly energetic nanothermite composites. What is it, and where does it come from? My name is Nils Harrit. I have a master and a PhD in chemistry and I'm associate professor at the University of Copenhagen. And I have been so for almost 40 years. I have published close to 60 peer reviewed papers in the best journals. And currently I'm involved with research, X-ray time resolved spectroscopy on time scales of one millionth of one millionth of a second. In the dust, we found what we characterize as unreacted thermitic material um, in the shape of some very tiny red-gray chips, which have different properties. Most importantly is they're still reacting, some of them, and uh, in the reaction they produce molten iron, which is the prime indication of a thermitic reaction and such a reaction can be used to destroy steel structures. What we have found is a modern version of thermite which we call nanothermite which is produced in a different way. It is not just two powders being mixed. The material is actually built from the atom scale up. We call it the bottom-up procedure, which is what you do in nanotechnology. This has two consequences for the nanothermite, which separates, distinguishes it from the classical thermite. First, the ingredients are much smaller, which means they are reacting faster and they are more easily ignited. The primary elements in the red a material are aluminum, iron oxide, as well as silicon and carbon. The iron oxide appears in fasted grains, approximately 100 nanometers across. The aluminum appears in thin platelets, about 40 nanometers thick. It is the small size of the uh, particles involved in this material that allow us to characterize it as nanothermite. In ordinary thermite, the uh, particle size is much larger, and hence ordinary thermite is an incendiary. Whereas as the particle size becomes smaller and smaller, it can become explosive. Super thermite is sometimes called. This red material contains also a significant amount of carbon, and uh, the formulation of nanothermite is described by National Laboratory Publications 
also implies the presence of carbon. Uh, very typically. The organic is used with nanothermite in order to produce gas uh, uh, that is a very high pressure gas that uh, makes the uh, nanothermite an explosive. We do have descriptions from the uh, Livermore National Laboratory in particular of how they fabricated this material, it, but to, to fabricate it is, is not so easy. This is discussed in our paper in the Open Chemical Physics Journal published in uh, April of 2009. So far, none of these uh, papers have been refuted in the literature, the scientific literature. So that means they are unchallenged in the scientific sense. They stand as a, an indictment, really, of the official story of 9-11. One of the things I'd like to stress about these chips is that they uh, really shouldn't be there. They're not uh, a natural formed um, agglomeration of aluminum from the aircraft or materials that were in the building and iron oxide that got knocked off. It isn't just a haphazard bringing together of iron oxide and aluminum, which is the basic components of thermite. This is a material that um, is made up of nano-sized particles that are all very uniform, very symmetrical. The formulation of the gray chips is nano-sized. This cannot be paint. Paint does not have these exotic properties. It's impossible. We do not know which role is played by the red gray chips that we found in the dust. But we know, and this was already totally clear before we started investigating the dust, that both explosives and incendiaries were used in the controlled demolition of World Trade Center. This is quite obvious because of other observations, the molten iron and other findings in the dust. This is material that is, uh, is of military use that really shouldn't be there. And our whole society is being led to believe that these fundamental laws of physics, hard science, don't apply anymore. I think that should really frighten all of us. Um, just all the other evidence of seeing flashes and explosions and the melted metal and uh, the, the dust particles and with the, chemical, the explosive chemicals found in the, in the debris, um, it, it, there's just a lot of questions about what's been going on and that these questions have not been answered or even addressed in any sort of full way. My name is Rick Folks. I'm a structural engineer with over 40 years experience in engineering. I'm a president of my own engineering business here in Arizona since 1983. Prior to that I was a vice president with prominent engineering firms in the Phoenix area. I have experience designing large structures including power plant structures, shopping center structures, schools, commercial buildings, uh, you name it. I, I know structural design and I know that on September 11th when I saw those twin towers coming down I knew there had to be more to the story than just a fire causing those failures. That had to be a, a, a controlled demolition that we were witnessing. The government has lied to us and we need to get to the truth. Those victims deserve the truth. They deserve justice. What we have right now is a travesty of justice.